shotgun shell test with Mr Hoppy himself. Ferret King Simon Whitehead decides whether his rabbit control business can make the move from lead to steel. The code of bad shooting practice. We discover a new hunting film uploaded to YouTube, shot in the UK, which shows you how not to behave with a shotgun. Gold, silver or bronze, Paul gets out the tape measure to explain the difference between big bucks and small change. And Firestarter, this month the Moreland management practice of burning heather. We look at how the pandemic is being used to fan the flames of anti-shooting. We have news, we have hunting YouTube and we have Bargain Hunter to keep the trade bouncing along. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. hearing and I keep reading about and talking to people about the consultations about this five-year voluntary phase out of lead shot. We walk down here and I've got my board, my piece of paper, got a pen, I'm going to do some pattern plates. I'm not going to have them up in the air, I'm going to have them on the floor where I'm going to be shooting the rabbit and see between the two steel loads and the lead load what pattern I get. The first ones we'll be doing 32 gram five lead. So we can see here uh, 30 paces on the 32 grams of lead. A little rabbit here. Fairly spread out pattern. You know, got stuff. That's going to do the damage. It's going to stop the bunchy rabbit and the uh, in its tracks. But we'll now see how it compares to the steel shot. We have got the 28 gram fives. We've got one shot in our little rabbit and see how we get on. As we can see here, the wood hit there. Take the pattern, I was a little bit off, still enough, stop the rabbit. 32 fours. Better pattern in the areas, what's hit there, as we can see, a lot tighter, a lot better. These are the ones that have been stopping me rabbits for me. I decided to shoot on the hoop for a number of reasons. The main one is the time of year. A lot of juvenile rabbits running about, the undergrowth's getting up, and I didn't quite fancy ferreting. Um, so I thought I'd shoot on the hoof. I'd just walk around the hedgerows, around the house, and see what presented itself. And it was a beautiful evening, it's about six o'clock, and I went for a little walk with the gun and tested the loads. First one I'm gonna do is the lead cartridge, 32 gram fives, game paw from uh, Swillington Shooting Supplies. I marked the rabbits. Uh, with the ears or no marks, so I know this one is the uh, lead shot because it's got no marks on the ears. Got a few pellets in the membrane behind the fur. A few pellets around the head and the neck. Obviously, that's all I needed. So all in all, the damage on the lead shot one, very minimal, a little bit. Around the shoulders, leg, obviously in the head region. Uh, one of the pellets strayed, one of the rear quarters, but as a whole, a nice, healthy, clean carcass there, ready for us to prepare and cook later on today. I'm now gonna do 32 gram fours. Pretty robust rabbit, nice and healthy. Uh, this one was bowled over. Uh, the pellets were on the shoulder side, I, I think anyway, but look at the body. There's nothing on there. There's nothing on that body there. No pellets in there, so that's nice. 
couple of steel pellets in there. As you can see, that's a fairly good, good shot placement for once. So this one pellet there, the trauma was obviously around the, the shoulder and the neck and the head, uh, which is good. The actual carcass itself is as clean as a whistle. Last but not least was these babies, 28 gram fives. You can see, nice clean pelt. Uh, hitting the front, so the uh, damage is next to non-existent. And you can see where the damage is. <clears throat> damage is around the shoulder, chest cavity and head. All of these rabbits were shot obviously around the hedgerows and the meadows just weren't about, they weren't ferreted. So they've obviously got no damage from the, the ferrets, trying to persuade them to bolt. The shot was in the head, so that's quite good. very few if any pellets you'll see there is a little bit difference uh, the main difference i found was that the steel even though it was stopping the rabbits it wasn't going through the membrane on the back of the fur and really damaging the carcass so for me that personally that was a big plus we've got here three loads steel game extra which is 28 gram fives that's from hull cartridge we've got a game bar bespoke 32 gram fives and then we got hull cartridge steel game 32 gram fours which to tell you the truth this is my favorite this is my cartridge of choice for steel too so it comes a day when we have to shoot uh, a lead alternative even if it's just for harvesting animals that are going in the food chain then at least we've got a viable substitute that isn't going to rob us of the enjoyment we all have in doing what we love to do but also it is gonna stop our animals in their tracks. Thank you, Simon. Sterling effort on the self-filming front. And I must say, I'd almost forgotten about the lead steel debate. Now with steely determination and lead in his pencil, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Wild Justice is back. After losing its bid to force a review of Game Bird release, it is turning its attention to the general licenses in Wales. It has a crowdfunder page up to pay for a legal challenge to Welsh general licenses. It is especially to knock the J, Jackdaw, Magpie, and Carrion Crow off the Welsh general licenses. The gun trade has been helping pass the time in self isolation by offering some great competitions. Among them, John Rothery is giving away a Numerex air gun worth £300. Jack Pike's giveaway is £250 of Jack Pike kit. And an Instagram page called The Shooting Diary is running a raffle to benefit NHS charities. Among prizes including shooting and stalking, Blaser Sporting is offering a Zauer Keepers package. Well, when I was asked if I would want to support it um, on the stalking side of things, it was an immediate yes. Um, so we're in there with a Zao 100 Classic XT coming in 308 and a Minox 2.5 to 10 by 50 all uh, together with a Hexalock mount. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust is offering a free qualification. The GWCT's Shoot Operators Test is now free for everyone to take. Demonstrate that you're up to speed with best practice and the key issues in shoot management. The link is in the description below. Gloucestershire Police is reporting a number of poaching incidents. In six separate cases in the past few weeks, they found a deer shot in the jaw and another shot in the neck, which was still alive. It's happening close to the villages of Sapperton and Carmsden. The police investigation is ongoing. American gun retailers can still offer curbside services for guns and ammo. The new rules are part of America's coronavirus pandemic reaction, as announced by the US Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. Firearms businesses have already been deemed as essential service by the US Department of Homeland Security. Staying in the States and the US government has announced that it's going to open 2.3 million acres of wildlife land refuge and fish hatcheries for hunting and fishing. 
The Department of the Interior proposal earlier this week includes dozens of firsts for the hunting of a long list of wild animals including deer, bear, elk and mountain lions, along with migratory birds on public lands across the US. And finally, hunt staff across the country have found interesting ways of exercising the hounds. The old Barks Hunt set up this hound race, raising £2,000 from bets, with a quarter of that going to NHS charities. And these two are simply keen to entertain the hounds. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And there is more news on our website. Link in the description below. Now, we're often told how to shoot, not often told how not to shoot. A group of enthusiastic shooters in Huddersfield has put up a film on YouTube a couple of weeks ago that really does that job for us. It's become a mockery on social media. You might have seen it featured by Johnny from the gun shop Botley. I got together with Tim Weston from the National Gamekeepers Organization to produce the code of bad shooting practice. YouTube offers hunters the chance to show their hunting skills to the world. A new film is raising eyebrows and not in a good way. So what lessons can we learn from it? This is our, our main narrator. This is the shooting party. And this guy has got his gun pointed straight at his friends. Right, OK, excellent. So well, the first thing we've got here, we've got a closed gun pointing at... Um, pointing at his, his shooting buddies. He might argue that, that the gun is empty, but I mean, it's just for the, for the point of view of basics, does that matter? Of course it matters. I mean, we, we're taught from a, a dot, a kid, when we start shooting, that a closed gun should always be treated as a loaded gun, full stop. Um, I remember, and I wouldn't recommend this to anybody, but my first ever head keeper, a beater got on the beater's trailer with his gun closed. He said, is that loaded? No, no, so he went to open it to show him. He said, well, stick it in your mouth and take the safety off and pull the trigger, which he wouldn't do. And he said, well, then you don't know it's not loaded, do you? So you never get anywhere with a, with a closed gun. Absolutely. So everyone else can see it's not loaded. But it's not actually illegal to do that. This is just, this is, this is the difference between illegal and, and good practice, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, of course, absolutely. But it's, it's the same as it's not illegal to drive at 30 miles an hour outside of school. But it's not a very good idea at nine o'clock in the morning, is it? You drive at 15. Yeah, okay, so they've got a pheasant up against a fence here. And, um, but, but that, that is not the, uh, the actual, <laughs> the uh, crime, the contravention. But he gets out and then he fires into a line of trees. And we know, we can hear from the audio, there's a very busy road behind that, possibly a motorway. So this is the never shoot where you can't see line, isn't it? It's absolutely ludicrous. We, we've got a, we got very close hedge. The shot will pass through that. It doesn't look like it's particularly thick. Um, they don't know what's on the other side of that hedge. As you say, from the audio, you can hear a, a pretty major road. It's not a particularly thick hedge. If you look, you can see light straight through it. Um, so that's not going to stop the shot. But even if it was a thick hedge, you shouldn't be shooting into something you can't see on the other side. You need to have back safe backstops. Or be shooting in the sky if you're using a shotgun. You, you, you know, you, you don't shoot on a horizon or through a hedgerow. There could be anything there. Well, we're pretty sure it's lorries, but, but, uh, but I mean, sky is the thing, isn't it? You, you need sky. Um, OK, we've got one more. Right, this guy's picking up a bird and the reveal is it's a starling, which is illegal. Now, this is, is this, I think it's the only crime they've committed in this video, isn't it? Yeah, it, lo it looks like it. I mean, this is unnecessary at the minute they're a decline species they're no longer on the general license uh, so we, we we shouldn't be controlling them without an individual license to do so if you needed to do so um i've not heard of one being issued and certainly not for sport shooting it looks like they are shooting at racing pigeons those those are i would say racing pigeons rather than town centre feral pigeons is that legal I, I don't think it would be legal under the general license to shoot at racing pigeons uh, for sport. And I think what they're doing there is is illegal 
for, for, for various reasons, the main one being under the general licence. But they, they could call it, I mean, they're on a stubble, they could call it crop protection probably, couldn't they? They, they, they could do, I think that'd be a really tenuous defence with what they've gone on in the past on their video. I think I don't think that would stand up. I think anyone, any judge worth their salt would probably say, you've put a whole thing on YouTube here. A lot of it's bad practice. Some of it's illegal. Why should we believe all of a sudden you started doing crop protection? So if I accidentally shot a racing pigeon uh, while out decoying, for example, and one came flipping over and I knocked it down, am I doing something illegal? No, I think that would be legal under the terms of the general licence. Um, feral pigeons are on the licence, along with wood pigeon, for the certain criteria, and crop protection is what you'd be doing, Charlie. So if a racing pigeon, a feral pigeon, came to your decoy pattern and you were adhering to all the other conditions under the general licence, that would be legal. They drive rapidly across the field and they're sh shooting two guns out of car windows at the at the, the flock of pigeons that they can see. Yeah, in that, in that instance, what they've done to shoot the pigeons is illegal. But shooting out of a vehicle with a shotgun isn't. And the reason for that, if we look at rabbit control, a lot of that is done from a moving vehicle around a headland of a field. So to make one form illegal is very difficult, not another. So. The actual shooting out of the vehicle with a shotgun is not illegal. Um, but in, the, in what they've done and what they've killed makes it illegal. We sometimes get comments on our films uh, about uh, shooting uh, uh, over car bonnets. I and mean, in some countries, uh, you're not allowed to be anywhere near your car when you when you shoot. And that's usually with a, with a rifle. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, I mean, if we're talking about deer, you, the Deer Act allows you to shoot from a vehicle as long as, as, long as the engine is switched off. So you can shoot from inside and use it as a mobile high seat, and that could be a safety safety measure for you. In terms of foxing, a huge amount of our foxing is done from a vehicle to simply allow us to cover the ground. And, and, and again, it's done in a controlled, safe manner, as opposed to tearing around with a gun out of a window. You know, it's done it's done methodically and safely. When you're dealing with shooters in the UK who are that enthusiastic. What can you do? I mean, do you, do you, bring, do you bring them into the fold or, or you know, should you put them in prison? Which is it to be? <laughs> I, I think education's key. And, and I think bringing everybody into the fold is, is far better than putting them in prison, for example. And I, and I think all walks of life, we can, we can look at the same thing. Start a dialogue with them, but not in a, not in a Facebook finger pointing, I'm better than you are way. In a in a sort of look, let's help you, and and I think one of the one of the key things I certainly see every day in my day job with social media, it's really easy to stand on a high horse and point a finger. It's much harder to make a social contact and say that wasn't great. This is how I would have done it. Let's have a discussion. And I, and I think that's a far better, far more sensible way of dealing with these things. And, and the same goes, I mean, the way I got into gamekeeping was in my village. I was catapulting pheasants at the bottom of our garden and I got caught by the local gamekeeper. And then every Sunday till I paid off the debt, he made me come help him. And I became a gamekeeper, you know, and I, and I think that was pre-social media. So that was in the days where they would say, look, look at what you've done. Think about what you've done. Let's talk about it. And now I'll show you the other bits that make it what it is. And I think if we could all do that, if we could all help people, our, our sector would grow exponentially. Thank you, Tim, for helping out with that. There's a link to the film in the description below. I don't expect it'll last very long if you want to watch the whole thing. Now a plug for NGO membership, new members of the National Gamekeepers Organisation and Renewals go into a draw for a knife worth up to £500. It's time to sign up to the NGO. This custom handmade knife will be made to the winner's specification by bladesmith Richie Nanks, who works from his forge in Cornwall. The winner will be drawn by the NGO team on Friday the 1st of May. I would like to thank uh, viewer Paul Cantwell for helping me out with additional reporting on that film and thanks to JP from Shot Away Films for sending it to me in the first place. Now I don't expect the guys in that film will be uh, looking out for new kit in the near future, not if their firearms inquiries officer gets hold of them, but uh, perhaps you do and if you do here is 
Bargain Hunter. Need outdoor clothing? Bailey's Shooting and Country Wear is offering 10% off all clothing from Shooter King and Game Apparel on its website. Use the code FSC10, that's F for Freddy, S for Sugar, C for Charlie, 10 at the checkout. Look out, foxes. Scott Country is promoting the Sightmark Wraith HD Digital Day Night Vision Rifle Scope for a whisker under £600, promising viewing beyond 200 metres when you use a high-power infrared. Simpson Brothers Gun Shop is offering a 10% discount on all its online products. All you need to do is enter the code SAFE AT HOME in capital letters at the checkout. And the shooting party is selling its first air gun rifle scope, the PAO F1 5-20x50 IRPA FFP rifle scope, has its reticle located in the first focal plane and is priced at £299.99. For all the links and more information, go to fchannel slash bargain hunter. Hope there's something that takes your fancy there. Now, Muirburn is an important part of moorland management, especially at this time of year when unmanaged rewilded moors are bursting into flames and those flames are sweeping across upland Britain and only really stopping when they hit grouse moors where controlled burning has created fire breaks. But it's a stick that the anti-shooting lobby likes to hit us with. And a big fire in West Yorkshire recently prompted calls for a pause in controlled burning. This wildfire spread rapidly across moorland in Strathhalladale in Sutherland. Local gamekeepers were the key workers who were first on the scene to put it out. There have been fires in Northumberland over the weekend, in Derbyshire over the weekend, for a whole host of different, even Cornwall. Um, I have a, a, a feed on, on wildfires and it's, it's quite extensive the amount of fires that are actually going on, which is totally predictable in this kind of weather. At the back end of the winter, but the vegetation hasn't yet got the sap coming up and keeping it wet. Um, uh, you've got nice sunny weather. You do have people out and about. Um, there's a great saying, isn't there, that wildfire is started by three things, men, women and children. April is the start of the UK's wildfire season with rewilded and unmanaged moors going up in flames and fire breaks from controlled burning on well-keepered moors stopping the spread of those wildfires. In 2019, wildfires burnt more than 100 square miles of the UK, killing large amounts of wildlife. A new book from the GWCT makes the case for controlled burning as a tool to control wildfires and benefit wildlife. Around the world, conservationists are are trying to use, increasingly trying to use vegetation burning as a conservation tool. And most of the evidence, and there's not a great deal of it, but most of the scientific evidence which is available to be able to, to like advance that as a conservation approach comes from the UK. In Scotland, the Muirburn season runs from the 1st of October to the 15th of April, with most work done in the first three months of the year. It doesn't always go right. Even controlled burning can get out of control. West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue blamed a large fire at Marsden on controlled mere burn that spread. Fire chiefs called for landowners to end the practice. Uh, well, I think, first of all, the Moorland Association voluntarily um, asked all its members to cease um, uh, controlled heather burning. Um, before government came, uh, you know, in requesting that, before let other the water companies or the national parks suggested that. Um, it's towards the very end of the burning season. Uh, most people have got what they needed to be done, done. Um, and with coronavirus, we, we simply don't need to overstretch uh, the emergency services. There was an unfortunate fire that was a controlled burn just towards the end of that period. Um, it does happen, it can happen, but it is pretty rare. And actually the best people to put a fire out are gamekeepers. They have the right equipment, the right knowledge and the right training. With the help of a gamekeeper, Northumberland Fire and Rescue brought a large fire in the Simonside Hills under control. Simonside is a grouse moor. However, in 2018, its owner, Northumberland Estates, agreed with Natural England to cease burning. This could be a result of that agreement. When you have a high fuel load lots for the fire to eat if you like the the flame length is just too great to ask any firefighter or gamekeeper to go close enough to actually control it and put it out you have to run the fire into an area of low fuel level to get a chance to put it out and if you don't have those fire breaks 
then it's um, it, you can't you can't fight it. Antis fight hard in the media and government to end controlled Muirburn because they want to see an end to grouse shooting. On heather burning and you're planting trees uh, in the upland or having more trees in the upland, there's a there's a great deal of unity behind it. What what becomes more complicated is when people I think try and manoeuvre it for for political gain in order to achieve an outcome. So if you are have reservations about heather burning or planting or planting trees or wanting more trees or reducing sheep grazing. Is that, is that because of uh, the conservation or environmental issues or is that because you're trying to achieve some other outcome? The anti's actions send confusing messages to the public about whether or not gamekeepers are in charge of moorland. In the Peak District last week, a gamekeeper confronted a group of youths on the Woodhead Moor who were threatening and abusive to him after causing a fire on moorland. The police pulled their car in South Yorkshire, leaving the fire rescue service and gamekeepers to deal with the fire. This follows on from another fire earlier in the week on United Utilities ground again in the Woodhead area. We're working with government, as I say, as eyes and ears. We've got equipment readied in the countryside. Uh, to to be uh, ready to go, water bases, uh, firefighting units, etc. We've had uh, uh, motorcyclists out razzing around on the hills. Wildfires have started in those areas. We've had kids out just messing about and gorse fires occurring whilst those. I think there's been some arrests in Derbyshire of some young people who have caused fires there. Um, and then there's the dreaded barbecue. Uh, the, the lockdown advice is taken as exercise a day. That doesn't mean stop and have a picnic and have a, a barbecue. Countryside groups are against a permanent ban on controlled burning. Controlled managed fire that literally just removes the canopy, leaves any moss layer, any litter layer intact, is a vital tool. Um, uh, and, and I think quite often that debates get very binary. Is it good or is it bad? Do we keep it or do we ban it? Um, and the single puff of smoke and, and somebody wants to blame somebody and say ban it. Uh, I just don't think that's a very uh, constructive argument. Uh, and it's the right tool in the right place for the right reasons. And we certainly know that the fire service would, would uh, be, be pretty terrified of having to face the countryside that is not managed. Um, we know that in Spain, for example, I think they spend something like three billion euros sending their own firefighters into the rural landscape where there's no longer economic farming. So there's no management going on privately. Um, three billion euros to burn fire breaks. Um, surely we have a very willing, experienced, knowledgeable workforce out there on the ground. Surely we should use that rather than putting more strain on our government purse. It is Green Party Australia's policy that these controlled winter burns should be undertaken. For more about the Moreland Association, go to morelandassociation.org. For the GWCT, visit gwct.org.uk. And you can buy Moreland Conservationists for three ninety nine or two ninety nine at gwctshop.org.uk. Thank you, Ben. Now, you don't find much Muir Burn in Bedfordshire but you do find Chinese water deer of all shapes and sizes, as Paul Childerly explains. Mr Childerly, talk to us about the wonderful world yes. of measuring, and in particular, let's start with your speciality, the Chinese water deer. Um, yeah, so the Chinese water deer, interesting species. Um, it matures very early, and they changed the measuring system on it quite a few, few years ago. Um, it used to be from eruption of the gum. The old way of measuring it was actually from the eruption of the gum out to the tip of the, uh, the tooth, um, and then there's a circumference of the eruption, uh, of, the eruption of the gum. Um, but now they're they exactly the same as the boar. You have to extract the tusk or the tooth and um, actually measure the full length outside edge and then the circumference. Was that a sensible idea? Is that something you approved of? Yeah, I think so. There's quite a... It's, there's a few things with Chinese water deer that they didn't consult people that work with them. The seasons is one thing. They've done it from 1st November to the, to the 1st of April, end of March, um, which, which is fine if you've got to manage 20 or 30. But when we were shooting large numbers, you, you could really do with that um, extension on the beginning of the season for the bucks. And, and personally, I think it should be run as fallow deer. So you could start shooting the bucks when the harvest comes off 1st of August, right the way through to 
you know, if, late on when we got late drilling, you know, we could shoot them almost to May as well, the bucks. <clears throat> and one of the excuses was that you couldn't tell the, you couldn't tell a buck from a doe, so it's safer to do it with the bucks and does the same, basically. Um, which I can agree with in some ways, but if you can't tell a buck and a doe, you really shouldn't be shooting them. That's, that's my opinion. Um, if you can't tell, get in closer. Watch, the, watch their, how they're um, reacting, how they're moving. So yeah, that would have been better for, for us when we have to manage like, greater numbers. Um, but you know, it is what it is, and you know, we, uh, we manage them just as well like it is, but it takes a little bit more harder work. With the bucks, they're obviously the only ones have the tusks. We have shot two or three does with tusks, um, same as you get with, with the roe deer, occasional does having antlers. The bucks start growing the tusks the first year. Um, this is the younger buck, as you see here. This was probably shot at about December, end of December, January time, and his tusks would have been about there. Um, as you can see, the gun would come to here, and basically there would be that much shown with the hair and the, and the lip of it. You'd be see, seeing about that much. Basically, you got here, you got the, the development over a year of a, of a, of a juvenile buck. It's probably that was no, end of November, December, going through to January. January, end of January probably, going into February, these two, February, into March, these three will be into March, and then they're out of season. Obviously it's a roadkill or something I picked up. And you just start seeing, it's probably midsummer buck here, you start seeing the, um, the, uh, the rear of the tusk tooth closing up. There's obviously an old buck. This would be a five-year-old buck. You can see the difference in the thickness. So you see this like development coming all the way through the months. It, month by month, it grows so much on them. Um, but you won't get much development after the, the two years. It will just get a little bit thicker, and more than likely, it'll end up like these here. Start to chip, get thicker in the base, but you've got the chips. Um, and it, you know, it gets worse and worse as it goes on. You get these chip bucks that are basically like razors through fighting and defending this territory. Quite a few people get them wrong when they mount the Chinese water deer. They put the tusks in the wrong way around, and you get the uh, the tu tusk sticking out <laughs> the wrong way. I just find two that are the same, so they'll have them in the wrong way. So you can see the tusk be sticking outwards like this. Obviously, if that was in in, in the wild, that would catch on everything and break. Actually, the right way is that way. See, so it's slightly come bending inwards. Okay, um, easy to be able to tell. It's basically, inside is smooth and silky, outside is rough, not shiny. See that? With the measuring of the Chinese, it's, it's not just about getting a gold medal and a, and a, and a trophy, um, it's about records. Um, and you find a lot of the European countries, all of, the, all of the heads are recorded and dated to the government, so they've got records going back years of red stags and the progress they've made, or the, or the weather's been bad and they can see the, the dip in in uh, numbers, <clears throat> and um, so that's what this is really for me. You know, I've seen so like, over the years how the quality of the animals improved. Yes, the tusks have improved, but the actual the quality, the physical size of the animal, stronger animal, how it's like the management by shooting out the bucks that are weak and the animals that are weak, the females that are weak, and and managing them correctly, you actually get a stronger, robust animal and, and fantastic for the species. Thank you, Paul. And now from Bedfordshire to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Aberdeen Wild Wings puts up its film of the 2019-2020 Scottish duck and goose shooting season. It promises great things for the coming season. One of the grandest hunt kennels in Britain, the corn opens its doors and allows cameras through them to see how hounds are treated, pretty well by the look of it. Rich hunting is goose shooting in the Netherlands, with Labradors Joe and Red, thanks to Mark Catherall for suggesting this one. Jeff Jefferson of the South Somerset Ferreters we covered last week calls this a very interesting film. It's the 
160-year battle Australia has waged against rabbits. Episode 6 of ABC Australia's Meet the Ferals series. Hunting with Stew is out after pigs in Australia from a kayak. It's all about closing the gap on a feral hog. Norbert Hunting from Romania made this film about a bear bow hunt last year in Canada. It's a road trip and it ends, well, watch it and see. DJ Decoys is on the second part of a trip to the southwest of Scotland, row stalking in late February. They stalk into a pair of animals partly hidden by a rise in the ground. And finally, a viewer called Graham has a YouTube channel dedicated to rat and squirrel shooting. In this film, he's clearing rats for a farmer, with permission from the local council. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film or a podcast channel you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, if you're starting your own YouTube channel this time of corona stress, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And of course, pop your email address into our register page. We'll contact you about the show. Field Sports Britain is at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. Go to the link in the description below to the Field Sports Nation to find out about that. I'll see you next week. I'm hoping soon to be able to wish you good hunting, good shooting and good fishing. Until then, goodbye. <music>